Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Uh, 30, years, 30 years ago today, on June 4th, 1989, after about a month of hunger strikes, marches, and sit-ins, pro-democratic protesters in Tiananmen Square, Beijing, were met with tanks and gunfire. The official death toll has uh, never actually been released, but the fight for democracy in China was heard around the world. The documentary Moving the Mountain by legendary filmmaker Michael Apted told the story of the uprising through firsthand stories from those who were there. And Michael and producer Trudor Styler are here with us now to discuss the film and the anniversary of Tiananmen Square. Let's give them a round of applause for being here. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I, uh, I love this documentary uh, for a number of reasons, one of them mainly being that uh, I, did, I just don't know that much about Tiananmen Square. I've obviously seen the photo, um, the legendary photo uh, of uh, uh, the man in front of the tanks. But outside of that, the actual story of how those uprisings occurred um, and, and what they were protesting for, I feel like, is, is, is rarely told. Um, can you talk about how you met the main character of the documentary and how this, this documentary started? What made you want to sort of hold on to and, and, um, and, and tell the story of Tiananmen Square? Well, well I met... Um, so Tiananmen Square crackdown, June 4th, uh, cut to New York, December 1989, me meeting Li Lu and uh, hearing um, about you know, his experiences. And he gave me a book called Moving the Mountain. And um, I um, read it and I was absorbed with the story. And uh, Michael and I go back a long time to a movie that he did uh, with my husband called uh, Bring on the Night. And I asked him, it, d did he have any interest in this particular story? And he delighted me by saying yes. So when Michael got on board, um, there were then financiers who, who came on, the BBC, ABC, um, and some individuals. And we got the budget together to make a feature documentary, uh, which um, we worked on for five years. Because by this point, by 1989, you were a fairly well-known documentary filmmaker. The Up series had been been going for quite some time, right? Yep. And tonight, in London or in England, 63 Up started. Really? Yeah. Three consecutive wow. Will that come here as well? Yeah, Not to course, go into a tangent of any kind, absolutely. but that's yeah. I can't wait to watch that. But, uh, anyway, anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, so Michael, what fascinated you about documenting the Tiananmen Square, uh, both the the protests and 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 what happened in the wake of them? We should also say that the documentary talks a little bit about the lives of the people who, what their lives would have been like prior to or leading up to the protest as well. Uh, I, I think it was well. I mean, the story is unbelievably moving. Um, but also, I just, I just thought Lee Lu was unique. And I think with the documentaries, with the ones I do, I, I do need someone at the center of it, some human issues at the center of it, so it's not just politics, blah, blah, blah. And he just seemed an incredibly interesting character. I mean, he was a child, practically and had made this you know, name for himself as a political activist of, of some great importance and world importance. But and I also, I just found him a very appealing person, you know, that he wouldn't be boring. My <laughs> wife told me, don't be boring, Michael, so tell me if I'm boring. And then, and, but anyway, I, I was just attached to the personality because it's a personality that brings something to life. Otherwise, you may as well just do a news documentary. If you want to get to people, you've got to have emotion in it. And he seemed to be very emotional and very appealing. Well, he's incredibly articulate and at times oh, poetic in his descriptions of what, uh, uh, of what happened. Yeah, I mean, he is a genius. Uh, we were talking just a moment ago about how quickly he learned English. So when when um, I met him in December, um, he'd uh, escaped from uh, Tiananmen Square and had been routed uh, through Paris to get here eventually. Um, various ways that he was hidden, hidden. They hid him under trucks. They hid him on pl on planes and on uh, on uh, trains. And he eventually got here, uh, and. 
in those wonderful times when dreamers could dream big, he was welcomed with open arms into the United States. Bill Clinton was the president at the time, and he was offered uh, open scholarships to um, all of the prestigious New York universities. He chose Columbia, and he studied in three years, three degrees together, uh, business, economics, and law. So he packed like a nine-year program into three years. And this is from someone who, who didn't really have English when I first met him in December. And uh, on his graduation day, he was given a party uh, at um, in Carnegie Hall because Columbia had never had such a student to graduate with so many honors, let alone honors, three honors. Um, I could so, barely get a liberal arts degree in <laughs> four years at a college with no grades. <laughs> um, so a brilliant man he is, and uh, and he bought. I, I do urge um, you folks uh, to 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 see the movie if you can. And Michael did a wonderful service by um, creating a roundtable in the documentary of the some of the students that had escaped, so that they could. Um, tell their own story and, as Michael says, give the human face to all those um, you know, million, a million students, we think, came to Tiananmen Square um, during that, um, that Chinese, China spring, they called it. Um, and uh, many uh, lost their lives or were shamed or imprisoned. Even, uh, I read, the people, folks watching from their balconies of their houses, they, they didn't escape uh, uh, being gunned down as well on that fateful June 4th night. Do, we don't know how many uh, were actually killed, right? No, no that's I, <coughs> a big secret. I, I think it's a few thousand. It's certainly not, well, the, the Chinese government say n none. And to this day, um, uh, President Xi says there was nobody killed. Um, and of course, if you've read the New York Times this week and all the articles, it's very clear that witnesses who were there on in the square that night, and we have footage in our uh, very upsetting footage. We have footage in our in our film that uh, shows indeed there were kids being killed and uh, and and men and women and and very young students being killed. Why is it for you 30 years outside of it being you know the anniversary of Tiananmen Square, which you have a documentary about? Why do you think? it's so important to continue discussing and watching films about and learning and knowing about Tiananmen Square and what happened? Well, for, for two reasons. One, you want people to know what really happened. And also, you know, I, I think it brings us closer to, to some, some of the Chinese politics and whatever, if we understand all that. And I think, you know, one of the most famous Chinese dissidents, uh, he's called uh, Wei Jingsheng. He served like 27 years in Chinese jail for his beliefs. Uh, we asked him in the film, you know, do you think that uh, democracy will ever come to China? And he said, he paused and he said, yes, I think through economic reform it will come. Well. We know China is booming. Economic reform has indeed come, but n d democracy most certainly has not. Well, President Xi is essentially president for life at this point, right? Yeah. He, He's appointed he himself that. Yes. Yeah. Um, what do you think? <laughs> it's a weird thing He's to no say. He's no fool, is he? Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what do you think? What What do you think it says about? Um, the act of protest, the act of the people coming together, having a spring, having an uprising, and the sort of collapse of that by an all-powerful state government like, like China. What do you think it says about people's uprisings? Well, I mean, it's very heroic, although it didn't, hasn't had a happy ending. But I just think, I mean, look at what we're living through at the moment in your great country and my a great adopted country. I mean, you. You can't stand for it. You, you've got to be there and say what you think. And th this was a fantastic example of people giving up their lives for their opinions. If you stop doing that, then God knows what happens. And, and remember, they were uh, kids uh, whose parents had really been very prominent in cultural revolution. And you know, u university kids you know, tend to be smart. And their parents were very smart people, but Mao had put 
the, uh, the intellectuals, he called them, um, uh, into work on farms, into labor camps. Uh, Lee Lu's parents himself, they were punished by being put into, into labor camps. So, um, and then the farmers were brought to serve the country in politics, and that sort of like gave rise to this you know, terrible famine where millions died. And um, I, you know, the, the students of uh, Tiananmen Square were kids uh, who had sort of like those, the shadows of the Cultural Revolution, like, like was remembered with the stories their parents had told with one of our students um, was um, Wang Xiaowa. She was, uh, she was older, she was like 35 when, when we met her. She had been a, a student there and she'd been in the Red Guard. So these were teenagers that, you know, that were co-opted to, to uh, be soldiers. Uh, so all these smart kids, you know, have the specter of cultural revolution on them and they wanted their lives to be very different. So when they came to the square, they came and they erected the uh, goddess of democracy, which is, you know, when you see who she was, it's our Statue of Liberty. And this was their China Spring and their hope for freedom and their hope to be able to think the way that they wanted to think, live the lives that they dreamed of. You said that uh, one of your subjects said that democracy could come to China uh, when there would be economic reform. But as you've also said, China's economy is booming. But similarly to the way that the United States economy is booming, there is still like, you know, a fourth or something like that of the people living in poverty or in China. It's existing, I think, on like, you know, maybe a dollar a day or something like that. Forgive me for not knowing the exact numbers here. Uh, but what do you think it says? What do you think it says about the people's voices and democracy when economic reform has only come to the few. When we can say on, on paper, sure there's been economic reform and there's booming, but so many people still exist in a form of indebted servitude at times. Well, I mean, I, I just think this film and the whole China thing is just a, a wonderful example of how important it is to be active politically. And you look around here today, not here, here, but here in your great country, you know what's going on in politics. It's not particularly healthy, I wouldn't say. Do you see parallels between the movements? Well, no, I mean, I have to be reasonable about it, but certainly there doesn't seem to be much interest in politics, pure politics. It's just all money, 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 which, of course, it always has been, but there has to be a balance between political intelligence and political use rather than just who's making more money because we all know where all the money goes up to the top. It's never spread about amongst the people. And, you know, we, we are living in a very difficult time in, in America. And in some ways, when you see the courage of these people and what they did, what they did was give their lives up for it. I mean, they haven't achieved, as it were, hardly the French Revolution or whatever like that, but nonetheless, they gave their lives for a better world. And that's what we should all be looking at for, for a better world, not for more money for the rich and no more money for the poor, which I think is what's happening in this country. Was it difficult for, for you? And you said it took five years to put the documentary together, right? Was it difficult for you to find some of the uh, some of the protesters that you had at the table discussing? Were people afraid to talk, afraid to speak out? Well, when they when they arrived, you know, they had uh, they were they they'd all sort of found each other. The ones that were living in Chai Ling was in Washington, right? right yeah. And um, and then. Uh, 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 Wakai Shi had come from San Francisco, and but they they'd all known each other in Tiananmen, and and had a there was a sort of like a, you know they'd all had functions to perform that was really you know, it had gone on so long the uh, the sit-in that it had become highly organised, and they taught themselves you know who was good at what in the leadership. Chai Ling was really the emotional voice, the um, you know the very petite young woman, very brilliant, very articulate, and she was the sort of the heart of the, uh, of, of the movement. And, uh, and our narrator, Li Lu, is great, 
intellectual and so it was sort of like very organized in how to lobby the government. They were, they were always sending messages uh, to, uh, to, the, um, to the government to say, you know, this is what we want and we won't leave until we get it. And so it was very structured uh, sit-in. Um, and, and eventually there was money coming in from Hong Kong to, to feed so many people for so long. And that's interesting that you said the, the uh, demands from the government, because I think it's even said at the end of the documentary, the demand was basically to be listened to take and taken seriously, right? Yeah. yeah, they weren't asking for money or power. They were asking to be noticed and not just trodden on, which is what they were literally as well as metaphorically. They were just run over by tanks. Yes, when the tanks came, you know, they, some of them had those little bivouac tents where they'd been sleeping there for a month. And uh, the, t the, the tanks just rolled over the tents with the sleeping students inside. It's unbelievable. Um, when you, I mean, you interview a young woman who is living in, in D.C., I, I believe, uh, after a couple years later. Is it D.C., right, at the, at the end? She, was she, is she, she, New York? she she was one of the, are you talking about Chai Ling? Yeah. No, she, well, she was one of the round table. When, when you see the movie, there are seven yeah. of them who are sitting around the table. She, she was living in Washington. Still. She was living in Washington, right. Um, who is, says something that is so, uh, I think, poignant, which is that she feels like she doesn't belong here and at the same time doesn't belong in yeah. China and illustrating how when you don't listen to the will of the people and what they have to say, you create refugees and you create people who don't want to, who don't have a place, don't have a home anymore. Was it tough? I mean, she clearly has a tough time in that interview. Was she, was it tough getting her to open up at all and to, to really discuss this? It's so personal. Yeah, who was the lady that lived in Los Angeles? She uh, was very, very emotional. Wang Chawa. And, well, Wang Chawa was, um, I think she was 35 when we, right. when we interviewed her. And um, she, uh, she'd lost everything. She had a child in, in China. So she, um, you know, she had a, a lot to lose. Uh, and, you know, they, they were broken spirited. I mean, they, they were all so young. And they didn't know anybody in America. I mean, to this day, uh, I see Lee Lu, and uh, and he calls me big sister, <laughs> and and I call him my little brother. Because if you think about it, they arrived with nothing, with nobody, as enemies of their people. So their families, you know, had a were given a hard time, probably this the shame that we we know um, this government uh, as named and shamed and there are, you know, visits to households to go, you know, your, you guys are marked as well because of your, you know, your, your kids escaping their own country and their own punishment. Uh, Wang Dan, who was number one on the most wanted list in the end, served, uh, I think, four and a half years in, in, in Chinese jail and then um, he was uh, liberated with the help of uh, the American government at that point. Is there a, a part of you that feels like there's a nostalgia to this documentary in the sense that it represents a time where in the West, democratic ideals and the belief in democracy was much greater? And we have this experience now where because China has a booming economy and can contribute to the sort of globalized economy, their suppression of freedom isn't taken as seriously. and. You know, we have a president that props up autocratic leaders, and it seems like the, the people themselves have sort of backed off of this idea of spreading democracy or believing in people's freedom across the world. Yeah, and, and this is what this film is about. I mean, and rather than being a kind of fairy tale when everything was wonderful and right, it's, you know, I mean, I even think whether we should carry on with it and revisit them and see the long-term view they have it all, because they haven't got much out of it. I mean... Yeah, that's what I'd love to see as well, as a, as, as a, a sort of an up yeah, <laughs> from moving the yeah. mountain, you know, in the sense that uh, where they are, not just a where they are now, but how they are associated with both the Chinese government and the global right. economy and, and, and where they're living, yeah. And it's so powerful when you follow people through and see don't just leave it and just go back to it and see 
what is what is the real uh, the real price they've paid with their lives. This, it was kind of romantic in in some ways. You could romanticize Tiananmen Square, but the reality is, it's still brutal, and nothing really was achieved. I would say. And I think that that's really. You've said it, Michael, nothing was really achieved. And I, I, I think bringing them together as much as we'd like to do that, I don't know that there would be a lot of willingness from the same group because they've had to find a life for themselves in the US. They've had to you know, embrace this culture and be part of it. They've had no choice because they don't have passports to, be, to go anywhere else. Um, and you know, going back to this concept of could that happen now if we had the, a crackdown in China on you know the the uh, the, the young uh, the, the, this demographic of twenty year old students, and if they went on the run to come here, could they get in right now? Well, they that, couldn't. They couldn't. Yeah, we know they couldn't. And I think just today, uh, for the anniversary, the 30th anniversary, the, the State Department released basically uh, a letter to the Chinese government demanding that they become you know, a, a free country and embrace democratic ideals. But when that's coming from the Secret Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and Donald Trump's administration, <laughs> it's hard to take that in any kind of good faith. Uh, double standards, hypocrisy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think we have time for a couple questions right here. Uh, what kind of films audiences want to watch nowadays? What, ki what kind of films? I, I didn't hear the question. Uh, what, what kind of films audiences want to watch uh, now? What kind of... Uh, what kind of films do, you, do they think audiences yes. like to watch now? Yeah, do you think? Well, I mean, it's hard to say. that. For me, um, you know, most of... The American film industry, Hollywood, is concerned with massive sort of comic books. I'm not, to, I'm not decrying the craft, but I mean, they're not really actually telling us much about ourselves, are they? Well, and I think, that, you know, within the movie industry, we're kind of starving people of stuff. I mean, television is pretty good at the moment. It's going through a good phase, but... I don't think we are being smart enough. You also came from a But I just want to add, that said, I do think there are more documentaries being made than ever before, and that there's, that it feels to me there is a hunger to, for people to want to know, you know what is going on in the world, and that, that has become... It, documentaries, Michael, when you were making so many, were never meant to be lucrative. No one no. ever... You know. uh, are they lucrative now? Have I missed out? <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> Holy cow. I'm you sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they, they are. <laughs> and becoming more so. <laughs> I'm fascinated, though, by, the, by the, uh, the amount of documentaries that have started to be made and the easiness with which someone can make them. When Michael made a documentary in the 70s or in the 80s and it was still shot on 16 or 35 millimeter film, or yeah. Michael Moore made a documentary, I think he made two or three throughout the entire decade of the 90s, those had a massive impact and people yeah. rallied around them. And to me, at a certain point, I think I've seen maybe 15 documentaries in one year on the heroin epidemic, and I'm kind of wondering what exactly is this supposed to tell me at this point right. anymore? Are we just photographing and viewing our demise like consistently? Sorry. Oh. <laughs> there's a certain, yeah, sorry. There, there's a certain uh, voraciousness with which we watch and, and consume uh, documentaries at this point and are obsessed with authenticity. I wonder the impact and, and, and how one can actually break through the way it used to. Yes, it's a, it's a chastening thought, isn't it? Whether mm -hmm. people kind of just get used to it and say, oh, that's another poor soul who's killed himself, as it were, in the long term. But whether or not we're doing it in the right way and, and really pointing the finger at government and people like that. I mean, it's all very well to go and get sympathetic stuff from people who are killing themselves or whatever. But is that getting us anywhere? I don't know. I mean, I, I would prefer that it was being brought back to where it starts from, which is the way this country is run and the way the, the wealth of the country is spread out. Mm -hmm. and people are so dis, you know, sort of un unhappy with life that this is all they, they've got. I mean, I'd like to be, do much tougher documentaries 
you know, about politics and whatever, as long as you can humanize it. You don't, you, the audience doesn't want to be lectured by it, but you, I mean, you can see the damage that Trump is doing and getting bigger day by day. If you could put that in a personal way, rather than just, you know, oh, another bang at old, poor old Trumpy, you know, it's to, it's to relate what politics is doing to people's lives and not just dealing with, you know, people who are drug addicts and whatever, but all our lives. Right. Rather than the momentary nihilism, finding some sort of context with yeah, which you exactly. can illuminate the, the grand idea about everything that's happening. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, uh, and I've managed to do it with the up films, but that's taken 50 years. Yeah. And <laughs> God, I would no say you were able to do it with Moving the Mountain as well. I mean, that's a part of it. And I think that also comes from making a, a film a, a documentary in the late 80s, early 90s, so much of that is about we have this amount of money, we have this amount of time, we have these characters, and we have this story to tell. Yeah. No, I think Moving the Mountain is, is a very moving example of it because, you know, we weren't there. I mean, you know, we went in, we weren't... How many years after it? So the crackdown was on June 4th, and um, that was 89. We went in uh, surreptitiously in uh, 1993. So, you know, there was four years, and yet we managed to, to, to bring it alive, to, to personalize it, so you could see how people really s suffered, you know, which, which I think is what you're saying, and definitely what I'm saying. I mean, it almost becomes a joke when you see more and more films about the same thing, asking for pity for people, and the people who watch it are the people that will give them money, but is it spreading the, the real problem into the, into the populace? Clearly not, mm. clearly not. Yeah, absolutely, uh, one more question. Hi. Hi. I was curious if you two could speak to the pre-production process with documentary filmmaking. Do you, what kind of research do you do? Do you do preliminary interviews before you start rolling cameras? Well, I, I never interview anybody without a camera rolling. I mean, I, mean, I go see them, so I know, but I, I don't particularly want to talk about what we're going to do. Um, and, you know, I, I never give people a chance to rehearse it, so we do that. So it, it's kind of strange and limited, because when you do a movie, I mean, the pre-production is enormous and very thorough and all that, because they're so expensive and they're so precise, but I like to keep a kind of looseness about it, so they, they don't entirely, and I don't know entirely what's coming out. I mean, I'm, I'm making the film because I feel strongly about the subject, but the details of the film, I prefer to wait until we're actually doing it. You know, I mean, I remember when I started out, you know, someone said to me, you know, you've got to be careful that you don't do the interview in the car when you're taking them to the site, that all the good stuff, because they can't do it again. You, you never get people to do it with the same power or the, the same integrity when once they know they've said a good thing and then they have to repeat it for you, it's, you can see that it's, it's not, not phony, but it doesn't have that kind of excitement of someone actually saying something and thinking something for the first time. So it's, it's pretty hair-raising. And, uh, and also, you know, I mean, it, when we moved from film into videotape, then, then that was, in fact, very helpful. I mean, it didn't help the documentarians who were, were, were artists, uh, painters, and whatever. But for people who wanted substance from interviews, it was great, because you can interview someone for an hour non-stop, you know, whereas the film, uh, I used to be counted down. You've got five more minutes left, three or people used to sit. So I didn't hit a big question or what I thought might be a big moment where we were about to run out of film. So there's something terrific about do, doing films on videotape and all that because you can just go on forever. Judy, you've produced a number of documentaries, and you also just directed your first feature last year, right? Yes, I did this program. For exactly, that's yeah. I remember, it was with me. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Has he not remembered? It was with you, really. <laughs> it was with me, I know, I know. That's embarrassing. I, I, didn't, I didn't know if you remembered, but I, I play coy. Um, with, with Anna Sophia. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, now, I'm curious if... Uh, how you have found the difference between pre-production uh, on producing a documentary versus producing and directing a, a, f a feature film? 
Well, this was by far the biggest um, uh, pre-prep uh, for moving the mountain. Um, and I, I, I did another uh, one about um, transgender uh, prostitutes who uh, worked between Brazil and, um, and um, Italy and France. Um, the pre-prep there was, uh, was kind of intense as well, but I, I was given a BBC researcher. So we had a, we had a researcher um, on this for, I would say, a, a, well, two years before we went to China. Right. So we, and we had our researcher go into um, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and China, um, because as you saw in the film, um, there's not a lot of, uh, of um, footage on cultural revolution, and it's very, it's a little bit, and it's very grainy. So we wanted to reproduce some of those um, uh, moments that Li Lu describes of what cultural revolution was to him, uh, and uh, and so we we found a way by going to Taiwan and doing some dramatic reconstructions of uh, some of the things that he was referring to. Um, and so in, within this movie, uh, we shot in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, and in mainland Beijing. You were uh, an actress before you became a producer and then a, and then a director. What prompted your, your shift? You, you stopped acting and you became a documentary producer. How did that happen? I, I, still, I still act. I was in a series called Maniac last year that Kerry Fukunaga directed. Um, I'm in one currently, but I'm not supposed to say which one. <laughs> <laughs> but you're mainly a producer now. <laughs> but I'm mainly say, right? a producer, and I directed Freak Show, which is an LGBTQ movie that uh, was, is about a, the life of a teen who transfers from a liberal environment um, in upstate New York into a more homophobic um, area somewhere in the south. We never say where. We don't want to accuse one state and exonerate another of being, you know, prejudiced against uh, gender. And uh, it's a, 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 a movie that uh, was uh, bought by IFC and is now available on Hulu. <laughs> it's, my a it's a wonderful movie. But what prompted you to start producing? Well, I had... Um, I had two children, uh, two young children at the time, and a husband who's a musician who was touring, and uh, we couldn't both be on tour as an actor. Um, in my day, you did a lot of repertory theater, uh, and, uh, and that's what I did up, up until I had um, two children very quickly. So I decided to uh, switch hats, if you like, and I went and saw um, great producer, David Putnam, and um, I asked, you know, how do you become a producer? And he gave me the sort of the 101, and I, uh, and then I set about um, looking for a project uh, to produce. And lo and behold, when I met Lilu, um, I thought this is this is something that should be told. And of course, it was very ambitious. Little did I know that my very first documentary would take me to, you know, a country that. Um, I am now uh, not invited to ever go back to. <laughs> really? No. You are disinvited, both of you? Well, I haven't ever applied to go back, so I, but I imagine I probably would. I mean, if Trudy has not allowed it back into the country, why would I? <laughs> um, thank you so much for being here and talking about moving the mountain and making the film and putting it on the radar and uh, making sure that people still talk about Tiananmen Square. Uh, 30 years later. Uh, the video is available for, or the film, excuse me, is available for streaming. People can see it, right? Yeah, the, so uh, so I, it's a download from Amazon and you can still buy it amazingly as a DVD. But I don't know, where did you get it from? A little place in Los Angeles. All right, all right. <laughs> you went to an actual video store? So you can yeah. find, yeah. You can yeah. find I mean, it in video stores. Yeah. <laughs> in the three video stores in America, yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can find it. Uh, everybody, please give a huge round of applause for Judy and Michael Apted. Let's hear it. Thank you.